Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much for, for joining and for your interest. We currently have um, 13 participants, which is great. I think that's a good amount to have a good uh, discussion. Um, I will briefly uh, share my screen and um, my colleague, uh, Joy Kara, um, will sort of help with taking notes and sort of like also managing some of the um, 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 questions that are put in the chat and sort of like moderating um, sort of like a bit in the background and also will sort of like summarize the points uh, that we've discussed in the end and will also uh, then um, report back when we go um, to the main room. Um, Joy, do you want to say a few words while I'm figuring out the, the tech? Of course. Um, uh, wonderful to be here and thank you for joining our breakout room. Um, if you have any questions like Victor mentioned, you can mention, uh, put them in the chat uh, and I'll try to get back to you um, promptly as I can. Um, depending on how many people we have today, and I think hopefully we have a good group, we could have a good discussion. And yeah, we can dive right into it and see why you're here and uh, where you're from and why you're interested in being here. So it's going to be a good 40 minutes. Great. Um, thank you very much, Joy. Um, yeah, so um, before we get started with the discussion, I think it will be good to um, find out uh, who is in the room. Um, created a, a quick Mentimeter, which I think is um, um, only uh, a very, will be very brief. And um, because we're not that many people in the room, um, I think we can even sort of like do some like some like individual um, introductions or those who would prefer to um, uh, quickly introduce themselves uh, and um, just quickly speak up. Um, so we start, uh, so you can go on sort of like um, make a menti.com and then sort of like use the code at the top. Um, and we will just, um, while you uh, try to log in, I will just uh, again briefly sort of uh, um, talk about some of the uh, key points that uh, from the presentation that we would also like to discuss today. So the um, um, main challenge that we would like to address in, in our innovation lab. Um, and I think um, especially sort of like the um, urban part, I think is something that's also, I guess, can be part of the discussion today. And sort of like how urban and rural kind of like needs to go hand in hand with in, in, in many of these cases. Um, so the question is, how can insurance help to de-risk investments in green infrastructure and natural flood management for public and private investors in the UK? And um, so how why we came up with this topic is that um, um, we, and that's sort of like also the evidence base, um, that nature-based solutions are a key element to reduce and adapt to climate-related risks um, um, because they do more than just reducing risks, but also um, help fighting loss of biodiversity um, and natural habitats, but also help with, for example, carbon sequestration. Um, there are many uh, co-benefits, um, but it's uh, difficult to raise, often raise funding for these projects, especially from private investors. Um, in urban areas, it's further complicated by um, ownership structures and space constraints. And um, we think risk transfer can help uh, de-risking investments. Um, in natural flood management and green infrastructure, but there's also an element um, which is, I think, um, also to be discussed, and I think there's different views on that. Um, in, in one shape or the other, at least collectively, it also benefits um, the insurance industry through risk reduction. Um, so uh, the idea of our innovation lab is um, bring together um, as many voices that work on these topics as possible and uh, develop an innovative business case that we can ideally um, also implement in a pilot in the UK with some of the sort of like partners we, we are having at, uh, discussions with at the moment um, and who showed their interest in contributing. Um, just as a first starting question, I would uh, be really interested to hear what's your professional background. Um, as you've heard maybe in the presentation yesterday, I think one of the um, um, important aspects uh, for the innovation labs that we have like a very diverse group of um, people in the innovation lab so that um, we can really sort of like get the ideas from all different sectors and sort of like also can sort of like understand the challenges that each sector has because there's so many different aspects that need to work together um, in, in this space. I'm just gonna wait a few more minutes for the answers to come in. So 
So that's um, good. We're already seeing there's like uh, some some diversity in the audience. So we have uh, um, academia, insurance, and consulting covered. Um, not sure if there's will be a few others. Um, also let us know if there's like some problems or if there's. I mean, also feel free to just speak up if um, um, Menti is not really working for you. Okay, we have um, nine answers. Um, I'm gonna give it another second to see if there's uh, more coming in. Otherwise, I would just move on. Um, seems to be we have a bit, we a bit uh, overrepresented on 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 the um, academic side. Um, I think uh, I feel like that's that's okay for now. Uh, I guess it's something we need to be aware of because I guess we also have like a clear. Um, goal of implementing those. So I think it's also interesting to have other voices heard. Okay, great. Um, just gonna move to the next slide. Um, so the, one thing that we would like to hear, also given like your different backgrounds, um, what are sort of like some of the biggest roadblocks that you think you can think of, um, either if you already have experienced them or sort of like you have sort of like from um, like hearing about or reading about other projects, um, sort of like what are sort of like the biggest um, roadblocks um, when combining uh, green infrastructure and natural flood management and insurance in the UK. And it would also, um, and it'd be nice if you basically just put in like some keywords that you that come to mind. I think like we allow for three keywords to be put in. Um, just gonna do the same. Yeah, we um already getting um a few very interesting um points coming in um i guess it's it's a quite diverse set of uh challenges which is very interesting i think we don't see a single one really popping out i think there's like some that have that are similar um in in terms of um the challenge um I'm just going to wait maybe a few maybe a minute or two more to give you the opportunity to put in what you think the biggest roadblocks are when combining um, um, green infrastructure, natural flood management, and insurance in the UK.
Okay, um, great. Thank you so much. Um, I think we we got um, quite a bit of like diverse uh, um, set of challenges. So thank you very much for um, putting in your your thoughts. Um, what I uh, would like to do next is to um, go through some of those that pop up and um, who of you or like if several of you have sort of like put this in or have sort of like similar thoughts, it would be great if you uh, to hear your your thoughts and a bit more about sort of like what you think the challenge is. So I think um, if you, uh, if I would call out some of those, if you could like briefly raise your hand and maybe um, and unmute and maybe briefly introduce yourself and your background and why you, uh, what you specifically think the, the challenge is. Um, so uh, one that I um, seemed, uh, seems um, to be linked uh, uh, seems to be the um, valuation of benefits, um, evidence base, um, and sort of, I think, um, an uncertainty and limited space, and a limited space, not really, but valuation but evidence base and, and uncertainty. So um, if there's someone who wants to, to speak about that, um, maybe also, especially in regards of like the evaluation of the, of the benefits. Hi, so I put the valuation of benefits. I didn't put the other ones, um, but so I'm Liliane I'm from uh, Vito, Belgium, which uh, is a research institute. So I put consulting, but I'm not always sure where exactly we are in the in the scope of um, organizations. No, I think I wasn't a bit in doubt to join this session or the one from Lab One because my work is focused a bit on both of them. Uh, we work a lot on valuation of green infrastructure and um, that kind of topic. And we always struggle with the valuation of the more like soft benefits, the co-benefits, because it's always the more difficult part to show to investors like, okay, the, it's much more than only um, the very visible benefits that we can that we have market values for, and it's always the the part where we struggle, and that's why I'm also like super interested to see where this project will go to, and definitely link as well with the with the insurance sector. I think it's it's very interesting, uh, but it's something we struggle with a lot, and I think it's definitely linked. I think the whole insurance um, sector will also be very interested in the valuation part. So I was also wondering how you will collaborate maybe with, with the people from Innovation Lab 1, because there the focus is really on that, that valuing um, question. So yeah, that's that's why I put it on there. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, really, really important um, uh, input. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, I think there's there will be a lot of collaboration on that with Lab 1. And I think there is also, some work going on um, at one of our partners at uh, WTW, um, who thinks also a lot about uh, the modeling. And I think, um, I think, I mean, well, valuing the sort of like direct sort of like flood uh, um, risk reduction element in terms of like direct damages, I think is one part, but I think what you also mentioned, I think is a really Im important contribution is uh, how to how to value all the other benefits and especially because maybe not all of these benefits are the benefiting the same people. So um, if you think about sort of like carbon sequestration, or if you think about sort of um, um, things like um, um, sort of like improved health and air quality, I mean, these are all different people who diff benefit from, from different aspects of, of a nature-based solution. So I think that that is, that is a, a, a challenge. And um, I think, uh, one, I think that's also something that, um, and I, because I've seen that Jonathan is also in, in the room, uh, is I guess that has a lot to do with the stacking. So, sort of like who um, who needs to get involved, and like how can these sort of like different parts of the project be combined, and sort of like where does it make most sense for also insurance to come in? Um, I'm not sure, uh, Jonathan, if you have uh, any reflections. Sorry, I don't want to put you on the spot. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, no, I mean, uh, I fed in a couple of the ones around uh, well, frameworks and standards is what I meant to write, but clearly I have a typo. Um, and that's specifically about that stacking, you know, it's the, whether I think it lies with DEFRA right now, and they've committed to do it more or less by the end of the year to essentially establish whether there's, you know, 
how much you can double count or what types of projects can go together, the kind of stacking and bundling rules. Uh, and that's really key for projects to know what their revenue streams can be, what is possible to combine with other things. I mean, the other one that I couldn't put in the limited space, but is a challenge for insurance investment is just the, the, the fact that there's an incentive for all of the insurers collectively to reduce risks, but not an incentive for anyone to invest in projects um, because it's this competitive market. You have this 12 month renewal cycle. It's based on shopping around based on price. So people are jumping around, you know, quite a bit. That being said, uh, I don't know if you saw a story this morning, I, uh, Aviva invested in another really big natural flood management project. They initially did this rainforest project. I think that was 38 million. They just put 21 million into a salt marsh project today. So for those that have a significant chunk in the market, they, you know, or Aviva, who's the biggest player, they seem to have really embraced this. So there's an incentive for someone who's big enough, which kind of goes against a little bit what I said, which is, is good news that there's exceptions to that kind of competitive market. Uh, you know, there's, there's some who race to the top while others have a bit of a disincentive sometimes. Um, yeah, thank you. I think that's a, that's a really, um, interesting point uh i think that you you raise here that um yeah it's 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 like i mean the insurance industry i think there's a collective interest in doing that but i think it's hard to mobilize in individually um and i think also um looking at some of the points that you raised here i think um and i think probably sort of like something like the like the salt marsh project it almost seems to be because it's already kind of complicated enough that sort of if you go into um, 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 in urban areas where sort of like the ownership structures is even more complex and you don't have sort of like a big piece of land, you could sort of like um, implement your your um, nature based solution. Um, I think that probably makes it um, even more complex. So I was just wondering if there's uh, one of the people who um, put in private property cost of land ownership if they can uh, on private land if they can say um, uh, something uh, about that. Any sure. Yeah, so my name is Carla. I'm a researcher at Stockholm University and I have been working a bit with nature based solutions in urban areas um, and one of of my concerns is that the need for uh, for implementing or the best places uh, to to implement nature based solutions to make them more effective in terms of uh, runoff retention or, or flood mitigation is uh, um, quite often located in private properties. So the thing is. Uh, okay, how do we convince uh, private owners in um, sharing their land or losing, let's say, their land to implement something that will be benefited or uh, will be of benefit for the overall community and not just by for themselves? So I think that this is an important aspect that if we want to go for more effective uh, uh, nature-based solution measures, if we want to go for upscaling, it is something that we really need to, to consider how to engage these private owners, convince them sharing their lands for, uh, for something that is uh, for um, mostly for other people and not uh, exactly for themselves. So I think that it may not be so much regarding insurance, but they need some financial support um, for, a, for a convince them to share their land, I would say. So this is just something for us to debate also. Um, yeah, uh, um, thanks, Carla. I'm not sure if there's any, any immediate reflections on that. Um, otherwise, I, I think I have a few thoughts, but I think I would first like to give you the opportunity if anyone has also thoughts on this. Okay, and um, I mean, one thing that I, I mean, it's also what I've um, showed in sort of like one of the case study examples, I think one 
idea in this regard that's brought forward is sort of to basically um, make this like a service that you couldn't sell as a as a private landowner. So you essentially um, you you you're keeping your um, or you you're implementing a solution or like a a, um, um, a green infrastructure or like natural flood management solution on your land. And because you become a service provider for these solutions, um, others can pay for it. So, for example, like the utilities who benefit from it because in an urban areas because they would um, have to um, um, deal with less stormwater in their in their um, sewage and drainage systems. Um, 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 building developers who have um, um, in many countries. Um, have an obligation to um, manage stormwater um, so that they um, from their property because when they seal surfaces that they also have an opportunity uh, have um, um, are, are contributing to um, surface water runoff um, and uh, I'm, I'm not sure sort of like how um, well this will work in the UK I think there are now a few plan case studies and notes sort of like the Greater London Authority is considering something uh, in, in this direction in terms of like stormwater credits. Um, I guess one of the challenges um, that I see with this is, is that it's, I think to, to in order for the market to function, people also need to see a value in this and that somebody needs to step in and basically set a price. Um, I think there needs to be a whole regulatory set that's sort of like um, that would mean that everybody who contributes to uh, like the stormwater problem would also need to pay for that, and those uh, and that money would then go towards um, the the ones who um, implement it. But another issue that I see with that is, um, and I think that's maybe it's, I think that's not something that has been um, discussed um, in, in in this round. But I think there is a problem around equity um, because those who own a lot of the land will basically that's another revenue stream for them and it might not necessarily um, um it might not necessarily help with sort of like some of the inequality and equity um, um issues we see in in urban areas but i'm i'm also interested to hear your thoughts on this if there are any thoughts uh, I mean, one thing just to, there, I noticed there was a study that came out fairly recently, I think Sheffield, I'll, I'll find it and put it in the chat, but um, they made a case for council tax to be reduced for permeable surfaces. So it's definitely out there. I think uh, there's, there's some local authorities that are considering it, but it's, it's quite difficult to do in practice because there isn't always a clear evidence base for what does what. Uh, that being said, there's getting to be much better uh, technology for permeable driveway surfaces. So just sort of like bricks that also let water through. That alone could make a very significant difference. Uh, it's not widely used, uh, but the shift to kind of like green permeable driveways would have the ability to uh, affect quite a bit of uh, urban land. So, you know, not it's not a, a full scale nature based solution. It's just a, a slightly different technology that if put into more wide use could could affect the issue. Um, yeah, that's, that's a really interesting point. And um, I think uh, before, uh, maybe I would also like to because I've seen there's like one or two of um, like NGO partners here. So I would also be very interested to hear their background and views. Um, one one um, immediate response to them, I think this is something that has also come up in some of the previous um, um, sort of like presentations of Innovation Lab is, um, I think there's there's also a conflict between uh, what is good for um, biodiversity and what is good for flood protection um, or uh, flood risk reduction. And I think that's also something that's probably really, um, that's I see as another challenge that needs to be managed in terms of, if we um, plan to implement something that like what what is the contribution for biodiversity what is the contribution for flood risk reduction how we how do we balance the two um, so I, I'm I'm not sure if there's any any reflections or any any ideas or thoughts on that um, 
otherwise it would be also nice to hear from uh, whoever uh, said they, they're from an NGO to basically get also their motivation to join and sort of like what they what they're hoping to get from this. Uh, yeah, just I mean, on the flood reduction, I mean, flood reduction has relied pretty heavily on concrete <laughs> for quite a while. And that's that's probably uh, a part of the the um, contradiction there. So moving towards more uh, nature based flood management pro uh, processes will help that certainly. I mean, some some are still, you know, there, there's still maybe a trade off, but it's not as absolute a trade off as large swaths of concrete and straight culverts down the, the river and, you know, those sorts of things. Yeah, no, I think that's a really interesting and a really good point. And I think it's probably also like a gradual process where we slowly, I mean, there's a lot of great infrastructure already in place and I think we don't want to tear it down. So uh, immediately, so I think there will be a slow process of like transitioning to to these solutions where they where they make sense and i guess now we probably start with implementing new ones and then maybe there's a there's a case to be made to like um, implement green ones on top of of gray ones uh once they sort of like come to the end of their lifetime um yeah very, very interesting um yeah coming back to um sort of uh whoever put in ngo would you like to quickly introduce yourself or quickly um say something i think just uh, would be very curious. I mean, doesn't need to be also uh, so fine if you just wanted to listen in or so, but um, just would be curious to hear sort of like your your motivation and your background. Okay, um, that's fine. If, uh, um, I, there's a question from Carla um, on the idea of stormwater credits. Um, yeah, uh, sure. So um, the the way it, it works and it's been implemented, especially in in the US in a few places, is essentially um, there's a there's a there's a regulator in a in a city. Like I mean, the example I showed was from Washington DC, um, who essentially needs to make sure that um, there is um, in, in enough, no matter how, how it's done, there is basically enough stormwater retained um, in order to sort of like um, um, put less pressure on, on the drainage system because it's very expensive and often not, very, um, not, a, not the most cost-effective um, um, measure to, to deal with stormwater because you only get this every now and then during a big storm. So like making all the pipes and so on way bigger to in order to take the water might might often not be the most cost effective one. So um, so the, the, the regulator um, essentially sets um, a specific amount of rain that needs to, in terms of like millimeter or inches, that needs to be retained either on the property itself. Um, and that's sort of like something property developers um, need to deal with um, and they have and they give them basically two options. Option one is um, you pay for um, um, for like you pay for the measure yourself and you do it on your on your own property um, um, and you basically implement green infrastructure on your own property uh, or find another solution to basically don't put the rain uh, and the, the storm water in into the system. Or which is sort of like the where the stormwater um, um, retention credits come in, or you you buy these um, credits, which sort of like are also the equivalent of an amount of rain that's like held back. And these um, credits, the way they come into the market or like how they're emitted, is by someone investing into um, a green infrastructure um, um, project somewhere on their own land, um, and um, basically. Um, it needs to be sort of like checked by the regulator what their sort of like um, actual stormwater retention um, level is. And once sort of like that's, um, that's sort of like um, um, set, uh, the, the, the credit um, will be emitted and then can be bought by property developers. So there is a revenue stream that goes from through sort of like a mediator or like an, a, a credit aggregator from um, the um, 
um, property developer who has a mandate to um, basically reduce stormwater going into the system. And that money goes to the person or the, um, the land owner who um, implements these measures. So they can actually um, make money by implementing these measures and it actually makes it like an like an investable proposition so the landowner can either use their own resources to do this but they can also try to get additional investors in who basically don't own the land but are interested in making money with these stormwater uh, retention credits and they would essentially pay for the measure to be implemented and maintained um, and in return, they would get sort of like a constant payment, like a yearly payment or so for the service they provide by um, by service, it means um, keeping sort of like the, the rainwater out of the system. Um, and, um, and by that, you essentially um, create a market and make um, sort of even if you um, sort of like uh, don't have any sort of like altruistic motives to do that, um, you can see this um, as an as a pure financial investment um, and sort of like the, the landowner gets a share for hosting it the investor gets a share for um, for um, um, for basically implementing it and maintaining it and the property developer who would have to pay anyways to get sort of like the stormwater held back has has the choice to do it on on his own um, on his own property which may, might be less cost effective or can um, buy these stormwater retention credits. And the idea is that it's a it turned into an investor proposition. And so the money is allocated to places where they make where they potentially make more sense. Um, because it's maybe not the best solution to do it on the property, because I think there's maybe better use and there's a green space that's already there. Um, and that that sort of like would be a much better place to put put such a measure in. Um, I hope that I've explained that. Uh, clear enough um i don't know color any any questions or reflections on this um it's worth saying that schedule three of the uh of the water management act i get i forget what it's schedule three of but it's basically the sustainable urban drainage systems um requirement is going to you know government after sitting on it for about 12 years, I believe, uh, announced that it's gonna implement this at the end of the year. Um, the details remain to be seen, um, but you know, it, depending how they choose to implement it, it, it could be something like that. That's a little bit of the, that's similar to the biodiversity net gain, the way they do that. That being said, I think they're trying to have it be as much as possible that any new development will implement sustainable urban drainage systems requiring minimal connection to the, um, you know, as little impact on the existing drainage infrastructure as possible. Um, but potentially talking to DEFRA about how the, they've been pretty quiet, I would say, on it since announcing that it would be implemented. So uh, figuring out if there are any evidence gaps uh, might actually be a useful thing in terms of figuring out what this, you know, innovation lab or project could potentially inform that policy, which should be implemented ideally by the end of the year. That's the commitment. Um, yeah, no, that that's a that's a really um, that's a really um, a good suggestion because I think what I think ideally what we would like to achieve with the innovation lab that we are sort of like aligned with a lot of the policy uh, um, making processes that and all like, like some of the new policy that will come out that sort of like we have something that um, once the policy is in place that we basically also can get going immediately and sort of like have done done maybe some of the heavy lifting um, um, before some of these policies come out and potentially also inform them uh, on the way. Um, before we, um, I think, uh, need to soon wrap up before we go into the main room and maybe I can also then ask Joy to um, sort of like give us a, a short um, 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 summary of, of the discussion. And um, one thing that I've seen here, um, uh, which I find interesting, um, was a point called um, on decreasing income level. Um, so who uh, um, put this in, I would be really curious to, to hear sort of like what, um, what it means and sort of like what the, um, 
what the what the thinking behind that is. Yeah, hello, uh, Miraj from Turkey. Actually, I'm an environmental engineer and uh, dealing with somehow engineering structures on uh, urban developments. And <clears throat> basically, these are seen as uh, responsibility of the local and central governments. Uh, but we are talking about now uh, somehow uh, micro micro solutions that will be basically, as I understand, um, basically be paid by the uh, private property owners. So, um, I mean, as seen in the last two years, the uh, prices are rising and uh, it, inflation is rising. And so people may have less uh, and there is a big gap between the uh, income levels of people. I mean, the uh, how can I say? The income distribution is distorted somehow in, in all over the world. So maybe the most needed people may not have the may not have such capacity to uh, place uh, such uh, technological structures or I mean innovations in their, in their own land. So I see this is a problem kind of. Um, yeah, um, thank you much. I think yeah, I think that's a really um, important point, and I think we see this all over the world. I think like I mean I think also the same in the UK. I think um, with now sort of like um, government um, like need to 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 cut spending and sort of like I think that's like in the UK is also like on only on the government level. Like I think like the highest um, 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 borrowing um, for a really long time. So I I think there there is a real and I think we see this that sort of like uh, all these projects and I mean I guess we all in this room agree that they they should be really high priority but I think we often see that uh, in reality they are not and it's like often one of these things that are um um sort of like uh, where, where like investments are, are often cut first um which is something that's um really really sad to see but I think it's one of the challenges because you in one of some of these things you don't see the immediate benefits so um so I think that's something but I think it's also what what you raised um in terms of like the private investments, um, it's an interesting point, I guess, I guess we, in this discussion, we've often thinking of like large scale investors or people who have like the resources to put a lot of money into this, but there is a whole thing. And if you talk about like property level flood protection, I mean, this is um, often sort of covered by, by, the, by the homeowner. And I think those people are under increasing pressure with like the cost of living crisis, inflation, um, and 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 so on. So I think there is probably also what we always had as part of the equation. I think it's also in in the UK that sort of like property um, flood resilience measures are part of the risk reduction equation. But I think there's probably more uncertainty around this than ever. Um, I mean there are programs to support it, but I think it's still if you have to basically choose between paying your your energy bills and um, implementing. Um, sort of like uh, I don't know, like some like nice green roof on your on your on the top of uh, or like a, on, on top of your house or something. You you might probably like rather push this um, um, into the future or not do it at all. So I think that's a that's a really really interesting point uh, that was raised here. Um, are there any uh, immediate reflections on that? Because otherwise, I would maybe ask Joy to to wrap up before we gonna be. Uh, um, probably be sent back into the main panel. Okay, I think we can 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 wrap up. Okay, so I will try to get a gist of what everything was said here. If I missed anything, please do let me know. You could just unmute yourself or put it in the chat below. So when we're talking about the biggest roadblocks when combining green infrastructure and natural flood management for insurance, we talked about the valuation of benefits, how the, uh, there's a struggle between soft benefits and you know it's difficult to show investors, and how to value all the other benefits. Perhaps all these benefits are not benefiting the same people. Different people, different benefits. Uh, 
have different benefits from nature-based solutions. Then we moved on to talk about frameworks and standards. Uh, there was some chat about stacking, um, an incentive for insurance to collectively reduce risk. It's hard to mobilize individually, so that was also a conversation. Uh, in 58 seconds, I will try. Then we moved on to um, uh, private land concerns for implementing nature-based solutions is often located in private. Uh, and then we had examples of what's happening in the UK. And then there was a case study with Sheffield as well. Um, if we want to go for more effective scaling and how to convince private owners. Uh, then we talked about stormwater credits. Uh, and then we moved on to decreasing income values, which is very important because we're talking about equality and equity at the same time and how because prices are rising as is inflation, there's a gap between people and nature based solutions take time to show uh, evidence so there that is something that also also should be addressed. Um, and it was much longer than this, but in 15 seconds, I think that was the gist of what we're trying to do. <laughs> Perfect, thank you so um yeah. Uh probably be sent in the next few seconds back to the main room. Um, thank you so much for your discussions. And 